So just a, a heads up for everybody there. Um, so yeah, again, thank you for being here. Uh, our agenda for this morning, if you go to our workshops website, workshops.cantera.org, um, you can find uh, a, a lot more information there, including the agenda. Uh, again, I'm Brian Weber. I'm one of the organizers of the uh, workshop here this morning. And um, with me on the call are uh, several of our other uh, uh, contributors to Cantera um, and uh, a bunch of people who are all going to be helping out. So I'll, I'll let them introduce themselves as we go through the, the sessions today. So I think we have a pretty exciting uh, program for you. So we're going to I'm going to try and, and get through these slides quickly here. Uh, and so just in the morning, we're going to be having uh, getting started with Cantera session. So it's going to be general information. Um, about the community and where to find examples wow, wow. Um, in this uh, uh, slideshow. And then uh, we're going to switch it. We're going to stay in the Zoom here, but we're going to switch over to the Jupyter Notebooks and talk about adiabatic flame temperature calculations, which are um, finding equilibrium using Cantera. And we're going to do that a few different ways and show you the one of the, some of the advantages that Cantera has. In the afternoon, we have um, two sessions with two or three parallel tracks in each session. Um, and so uh, the first uh, track in both sessions is going to be called Using Cantera. Um, and that's going to be a little bit more intermediate applications of Cantera. So calculating ignition delays, calculating flame speeds um, is going to be in the first session in that track. And then in the second session in that track is going to be a perfectly stirred reactor and a plug flow catalytic reactor uh, in the second session in that track. Um, the second track is going to be a bring your own model uh, kind of a thing. So this would be a case where you have a set of differential equations that you want to solve. Um, and you want to use Cantera to provide some, some thermodynamic or chemical information uh, for your system, but you don't actually want Cantera to integrate the equations for you. Um, so we have two examples there again. In the first session, we're going to be building, uh, building our own uh, PSR model. So taking the, the differential equations that represent the PSR, the perfectly stirred reactor, and implementing those uh, without using uh, Cantera's integrator. And then in the second session, it's going to be a uh, porous catalytic combustor. Uh, no, sorry, an electrochemical example. Sorry, it's a, uh, an example regarding um, yeah, electrochemistry. And then the third track in the afternoon is going to have um, uh, two sessions that are basically the same content is getting started with contributing to Kintera. So if you feel like you've got a, a decent grasp on, uh, on uh, how to do calculations for Kintera for most of the problems that you need to solve, but you want to be able to add functionality to Kintera or you want to come along and help us maintain Kintera, then uh, that session will be a, a crash course in how to get up and running with that. Um, so that's our agenda for today. Uh, we're going to be having all of the content is going to be in Zoom, different Zoom um, meeting rooms, uh, because uh, Zoom is a, a better interface for that kind of stuff. But in between, we'll have a few breaks um, throughout the day, as well as uh, lunch hour from uh, 1 to 2 p.m. Eastern time, uh, which is 12 to 1 uh, Central time, which is, I guess, the official time that the conference is using. Uh, so um, in, during those times, feel free to hang out in the gather town space. Uh, in the gather town space, you can um, walk around and um, when you get close to another avatar in that space, you can um, interact with them. You can, uh, your video, their video will pop up and, and you can talk as though you were in the same room together um, using your, your microphone and your camera. And um, also in that space, you can, you'll be able to find links to all of these sessions. And so um, in the afternoon, just before we come back from lunch, um, I'll talk about there's three separate rooms there that have the links for the afternoon um, sessions. Uh, so please make use of that space. Um, I hope it will be a, a cool experience. I hope that it will be useful and make it feel a little bit more like we're actually all together uh, in a room in person than, uh, uh, than kind of sitting in front of our webcams here. Um, and I, ha I have to apologize for any background noise. My, uh, my three-year-old daughter is home and uh, it being a weekend and uh, my dog as well. I don't know if you can see him in the background over here. Um, he very much wants to go outside and play. So he's a little, a little anxious right now. <laughs> um, okay, so that's our agenda for today. Here's the schedule. Um, we're gonna start with this introduction and then some equilibrium. And then we'll have uh, some, yeah, so, some introduction to equilibrium. Then we'll have a break. 
another part for the equilibrium and then another break. Uh, we'll have a little Q&A and then go into lunch and then we'll have our afternoon session. So all of this is available on the website, uh, workshops.kintera.org. Okay. okay, so let me give you um, a quick overview of Kintera. Uh, if you haven't ever used Kintera before, uh, if this is your first time seeing Kintera or, or maybe you're not familiar with everything that Kintera can do, Kintera is, uh, I think it's a Spanish word, and I'm not sure if uh, Dave Goodwin intended this when he um, started Kantera in about 2000 or so. Uh, so Dave Goodwin was a, a professor at Caltech who unfortunately passed away about 10 years ago. Um, I guess a little more than that now. Uh, and so his idea for Kantera was uh, to have it be a, um, a set of building blocks that you can use to put together whatever kind of simulation you want to do. So um, Kintera is a property calculator. That's the kind of basic, um, the, the basis of this uh, uh, Lego blocks or, or uh, something, whatever kind of metaphor bricks that you want to use. Um, and actually, Kintera uh, in, I believe, Spanish um, means quarry. So Kintera uh, is the quarry from which you can remove or you can pull out the bricks that you need to build your simulation to push the metaphor a little too far. So at the base level, we have a property calculator. So you can take out um, uh, enthalpy, internal energy, mole fractions, mass fractions, uh, reaction rates, transport properties, and so forth, um, given a, a phase definition. Uh, building on top of that, we have a few canonical simulations that are built in, um, including zero-dimensional homogeneous batch reactors, uh, which can also be equipped for uh, inlet um, and outlet conditions. Uh, uh, different reactor geometries and so forth. And then we also have uh, a set of simulations or a set of, of um, uh, built-in cases for uh, a couple of one-dimensional uh, flames and flows. Um, and so these models build on that property calculator aspect of Kintera to, um, uh, to uh, be able to run all these calculations. Okay, and then the third aspect that we like to think about here is if one of those built-in uh, models doesn't fit your needs, then you can uh, build your own simulation code using uh, whatever ordinary differential equations you have and whatever integrator uh, or solver really that you want to use. So um, uh, these are kind of the three levels of Kintera, and we're going to go through all three through, through our sessions today. Kintera has, uh, is used in a, in a wide range of application areas. Um, oh, and I, my picture got cut off here a little bit. Sorry about that. So this being a combustion conference, a lot of our examples today are going to be focused on combustion, um, but it also offers facilities for uh, catalysis and electrochemical systems. Um, and we are looking to actively expand into a lot of these different areas uh, as well. Uh, Kintera is most thoroughly tested and most heavily used in the combustion area, but we would definitely like to expand the applicability out into um, other areas, okay? Um, the, uh, the big strength that Kintera has is that because it, it's built on this building block kind of foundation, it's relatively easy to add new building blocks to that. Um, you don't have to go and rewrite everything if all you want to do is uh, add a new uh, uh, property that you're interested in, right? You don't have to, to totally rewrite all of the evaluation routines. You can make use of the existing um, building blocks that are that are in place there. Uh, so that's the big strength about Kintera or for Kintera. The other is that, which I didn't mention here, is that it's open source and the code is freely available um, online, which which we'll show you a little bit later if you're in the contributing session. Um, if you're interested in some examples of using Kintera, uh, we have a, uh, I guess it's not that new anymore. It feels new still, uh, a new website, uh, yeah, kintera.org. And if you go to slash examples, we have a number of different formats for the examples here. Uh, Python, Jupyter Notebooks, MATLAB, C++, and Fortran um, examples are all available depending on how you are trying to use uh, the functionality in Kintera. Um, we have a very supportive community as well, as evidenced by everybody who's here today. You are all part of the Kintera community now. Welcome to the, welcome to the Borg. Uh, if you are, want more information about our community on our website, if you go to kintera.org slash community, we have a bunch of links there uh, to places that you can go and, uh, and get more support 
The main place to ask for support if you have questions about how to use Cantera is on our Google group. Uh, and the link for that is on the community page uh, that, that's right here. So cantera.org slash community. And there you can find a link to our Google group um, where you can ask any questions that you want. Uh, and the um, uh, other place to get support is on GitHub, which is where the source code is hosted. And so that will be uh, if, if you find a bug in Cantera or uh, if there's something that's really just, just broken and not working, then you can report that on GitHub. Um, and, and we will uh, <laughs> take a look at it and see, see how to fix it. Uh, or if you know how to fix it, then you know, we'd be more than happy to accept that change as well. Um, on a similar note, uh, so Cantera is a fiscally sponsored project with NumFocus. Um, NumFocus is a nonprofit uh, umbrella organization that provides um, kind of a, a, a support structure for open source scientific software. So actually a lot of the scientific Python stack are affiliated with the uh, NumFocus project. And what they provide for us is a, uh, um, a legal entity that can be responsible for Cantera, kind of the project uh, as a whole. So the, the, the community is responsible for maintaining uh, Cantera for making sure that that Cantera lives on, but NumFocus gives us a place to have uh, someone to hold the trademark on the name Cantera and access to a bank account and and uh, and things like that. So at the moment, uh, several of the uh, core developers for Cantera are supported on an NSF grant. Uh, in the uh, um, oh, I forget what program it's in an NSF. Um, in any case. Part of that grant is explicitly to try and develop and maintain and build a community uh, of users of Cantera. And part of that is figuring out how do we fund our time uh, to maintain Cantera. There's a lot that goes into doing this, not just this workshop that you see today, but producing new releases, adding new features and all of that. It doesn't just happen by magic. So one of the ways that we've come up with um, to help support that is by donations. So please feel free uh, if you're able to donate to Cantera uh, via NumFocus, this all uh, is managed by NumFocus. So you're not sending money to an individual person, you're sending it to, uh, to NumFocus to support our project. Um, if you don't want to give just dollars, that's, we appreciate that, but they also have, we also have um, an official swag shop with cool shirts, mugs, hats, water bottles. They even have onesies for babies. So there's my daughter, Eleanor, uh, who you may have seen a minute ago uh, wearing the Cantera onesie that we have. We also have uh, hoodies, my hoodie is a little worn down. There, you can see it there. I've had it for a few years now. Uh, very cool stuff. Uh, very comfortable uh, shirts and clothing and stuff. So, if you want to get uh, a shirt, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, and then you can show off Cantera, and and people can ask you, what, well, what's that thing? Is that a band? Weird metal band? Um, so, yeah. Okay, so that's my uh, introduction for uh, my few introduction slides here. Um, and. Uh, so at this point, I think we're going to transition into doing some of those equilibrium calculations. And I think I'm just going to keep presenting and maybe I'll turn it over to someone else for the next, uh, the next section of, of presentations here. So uh, give me one second while I get this started up here. So we're going to move into the, um, uh, the Jupyter notebooks that we, that we have uh, distributed. And so, um, so I am going to uh, uh, share my screen here uh, with the uh, with the Jupyter notebooks, and and you can follow along. I would encourage you to open this up yourself and um, uh, and actually type along with the code. Um, you can get access to this code in a couple of different ways. Uh, and so let me just share my screen again. There we go. So if you go to um, github.com slash cantera slash workshop uh, materials github.com slash cantera slash workshop materials and I'll, I'll put that link in the chat um where's my zoom window chat there we go uh and you can click the um the green code button up here and then you can download a zip file uh, you do need to follow the installation instructions for Cantera right here, or you need to have done that if you haven't. Uh, if you haven't already, we have another way to access this uh, material 
Um, if you go to Safari uh, here, this, if you go to um, jupiterhub.cantera.org, uh, this is uh, going to be a Jupiter instance that's available oops, for the duration of the workshop today. Um, uh, and uh, so I, if you weren't able to install Cantera um, using the instructions on our page here, uh, or if you ran into any trouble or, or anything like that, please feel free to, to log in and use the Jupyter Hub here. Um, when you first go to that page, it's going to ask you for a username and password. You can put in whatever username and password you would like. Uh, there's no preset accounts. Um, it will just create an account for you the first time that you log in. Uh, I am going to be taking this down after the workshop, though. So um, it, the disadvantage of using this Jupyter Hub is that you can't really save your work, or it's, it's at least a little more difficult to save your work. Uh, whereas if you download the code onto your own computer, install it onto your own computer, then you can keep whatever you've done. Um, okay. Uh, what questions does anyone have at, at this point? What questions can I answer at this point before I, I jump into any of the material? Hmm. Okay, so once you've got the, the code downloaded, you'll need to start, if you are doing it on your own computer, you need to follow these instructions to um, uh, change directory into wherever you unzipped that, that folder, and then start a Jupyter Notebook. So I, I've done that in my terminal over here, uh, and, um, and these instructions will, will guide you through doing that with the terminal. Uh, please just ignore the, the screenshots, which are from the last time we did this workshop uh, a couple of years ago, or well, but, but I think the screenshots are close enough to how it looks now. Okay. If you have trouble installing, um, you can put messages in the chat here, or if it's after the workshop, you can go onto the Google group and ask questions there. If you use that Jupyter Hub approach, I think you you it has Cantera installed for you. So if you can't install, you probably should just use the Jupyter Hub and then. That's right. Yeah, yeah. If you'd like to follow along today and you weren't able to, oh, thanks, Ray. Um, that's the link for the the Google group there uh, in the chat. Uh, if you weren't able to install Cantera before the workshop started today, no problem at all. Um, that website is jupyterhub.cantera.org. J U P Y T. I guess I can put a link to that in the uh, jupiterhub.cantera.org. And so, if you weren't able to install Cantera before the workshop today, please feel free and use that resource. Uh, that has Cantera installed for you. It has all the notebooks already all set um, and ready, ready to go, ready to ready to get started this morning. Ooh, it's warm today at least here on the East Coast. All right. Okay, so um, what other questions do, do you all have at this point? Can I encourage people to type mm -hmm. questions into the chat at any time? Um, and then whenever Brian asks, are there any questions? Some of the other moderators who have been paying attention to the chat can just pull out the questions and rather than waiting for some a minute of silence every time he asks for questions, just post them all <laughs> in the text chat. Yes. So, uh, you know, um, just put in any username and password. Uh, Toshida, that's a really good question. Um, we have uh, an enhancements repository issue about that. Uh, the, long, the short answer is that it's not easy to compile Cantera repeatedly and make it work on other people's computers um, until relatively recently using PIP. Sure. So if you go to the Jupyter Hub, put in any username and password and, and uh, if you close the window, just remember your password. All right, so I'm going to get started here. Um, and like Richard said, if you have any questions, 
there's a, a bunch of people who are, are in the chat who are um, helping out and they'll uh, see your question and, and be able to address it. Okay, so this morning we're gonna start by doing some equilibrium calculations with Cantera and we're gonna start with a very simple equilibrium calculation or, or at least a, a relatively simple equilibrium calculation, which is the adiabatic flame temperature. Um, and so I, I'm gonna go through a, a short introduction to the, uh, um, the adiabatic flame temperature here, uh, just to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, with, the, uh, with the, the background. I know not everyone here is, is uh, deeply entrenched in the combustion. And uh, even for me, it's been a few years since I taught a combustion class. And so it was useful to have this review uh, as well. So we're gonna start by assuming a constant uh, specific heat. And so the, the background in the, the adiabatic flame temperature is that we have a uh, perfectly insulated reactor. So there's, there's no um, energy transfer to the outside by, by heat transfer. Uh, and we're gonna assume that the reactions uh, are occurring at constant pressure. And so if we write out and simplify the conservation of equation, uh, conservation of energy equation, we find that the total enthalpy of the products is, uh, is conserved. Uh, sorry, the total enthalpy of the reactants is the same as the total enthalpy of the products. And the enthalpy of the mixture has, or the enthalpy of each species, I guess I should say, has uh, two components. The enthalpy of formation of that component or of that species and the sensible enthalpy of that species. So the, the enthalpy of formation is the amount of enthalpy, uh, the amount of enthalpy um, that it takes to form the, that species uh, at the standard state from uh, the appropriate number of moles of its constituent uh, elements. And the sensible enthalpy is the change in enthalpy due to a change in temperature from the reference temperature. Um, and so we're going to pick the stoichiometric combustion of methane with air. Okay. In this um, uh, interface, in this Jupyter notebook interface, uh, I'll give a, a quick brief introduction to that as well here while I'm going. Um, the main interface is made up of cells. And so you can see I have the first cell in this notebook selected. Uh, right now I'm in what's called command mode, which I can tell because the, uh, the side of the uh, cell over here is blue. Okay, that means I'm in command mode. The other mode that every cell has is the edit mode. And so if you double click on a cell uh, and when the uh, bar over here turns green, then you're in edit mode. And uh, in edit mode, I, uh, uh, in edit mode, I guess I should turn off notifications. Is that a better font size? Yeah. Maybe even bigger, if you can go one up. Oops, wrong way, there we go. Yep. I think that's as big as I can go and keep it on the screen. Thanks. Uh, let me turn off notifications here. Uh, there we go, do not disturb. Okay. So in edit mode, the side over here is green and you can type text in the uh, in the notebook here. So here, uh, I wanna change this arrow instead of being pointing both directions, I only want it to point uh, from left to right. So I'm gonna go in and edit this, this text in here since I'm in edit mode. When you're in edit mode, to get back to command mode, you can push escape, um, but the, the code is not actually executed when you just push escape to go back to command mode. To execute the code, you, can, you have a few options here. The easiest way to do it is to push shift and then enter or return which um, executes the code in that cell and selects the next cell for you, okay? And you can see that uh, this arrow has now been changed to a, whoops, to a um, uh, arrow pointing left to right instead of in both directions. This type of cell is called a markdown cell, which you can see up at the top here. Okay, there's two, there's two main type of cells that we're gonna use, a markdown cell and a code cell. So a markdown cell lets you write text and format it, including math uh, using LaTeX notation. Um, and the uh, uh, code cells will actually be the Python code that we're gonna run uh, a little later on here. Okay, so uh, moving on with my um, uh, introduction to the adiabatic flame temperature or review of the adiabatic flame temperature. 
Uh, so at, when this reaction proceeds, uh, methane reacting with oxygen to form water and carbon dioxide, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, that reaction will release a certain amount of energy uh, according to the change in the enthalpy of formation of the reactants. Okay. And um, since the reaction is occurring at constant enthalpy, this energy release um, due to the change in the enthalpy of formation goes into increasing the sensible enthalpy of the reaction products. And so one way to think about this is that initially the reaction occurs at uh, a fixed temperature and we keep that energy and then put all that energy into the uh, products once the products are form, formed to change them from that initial temperature to the final temperature. So in, uh, in, the, in an adiabatic reaction, we have that the, therefore that the heat of reaction must be equal to the amount of energy that goes into the heating. Okay, so we can uh, set those two things equal to each other down here, uh, and then move the uh, reaction one over to the left side so we have an equation equal to zero. And then we can plug in all of the, the uh, terms that we just have. Okay, so um, this equation you can see is in terms of, uh, uh, or, or it depends on what the final temperature is to determine these enthalpy values here. And we don't know what that final temperature is uh, a priori. So we need some other way to, to estimate that temperature. Um, and this is where we're gonna get into a, a couple of these different approaches, uh, starting with this constant, uh, constant enthalpy approach. Okay. Um, so one way that we can uh, find the enthalpy values that we need to solve that equation is by using the JANF tables. Uh, the JANF tables uh, are our thermodynamic database that's maintained by NIST, that's been around uh, longer than I've been alive. Uh, and so these provide uh, a range of thermodynamic properties, including enthalpy of formation, including the uh, 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 total sensible enthalpy, uh, the specific heats, and uh, uh, there's a lot of species that you can find available. This link will take you to um, janf.nist.gov, and you can find the tables there uh, um, for any kind of species that you that you want to find. Uh, and if you look in the um, back in our, our Jupyter notebook over here, if you look in the data folder, we downloaded a couple of the uh, GenF tables that are relevant for this problem for your reference if you want to go and take a look at them. Okay, so for simplicity, I'm just going to um, avoid uh, showing you those and just say that we got the enthalpies of formation for all of those species here. Um, in the, uh, for all the species that we're interested in here. Uh, so for methane, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and water, notice that the enthalpy of formation for oxygen and nitrogen is zero because those are actually uh, the standard form of those elements at the reference, at the reference state. Uh, and so we define the enthalpy of formation of those two species to be zero. Okay, so at this point with that, uh, um, with that out of the way, with that intro out of the way, uh, I'm going to split us out into breakout groups now. How did, I see a lot of people are back already. That's great. How did everybody make out with that? Did everybody get it to work? Any, any issues crop up? Any? Uh, I'll anything go wrong? Work. Okay, good. I had a great question from one of the participants in my, um, in my uh, breakout room. Uh, Matthew asked uh, uh, why we're choosing Python for the workshop today, uh, whether there are any technical advantages or was it just kind of for convenience? And I, the answer is it's a, it's a little of both, is that Python is a great language to learn if you've never done programming before. Um, and it's relatively easy to read Python code um, and type it out. It's not like C++ or something like that, where there's just a bunch of everything going everywhere. Um, and in terms of Kantera, it's the, uh, most complete interface uh, along with the C++ interface. The MATLAB interface uh, works for the most part. There's some problems with one dimensional calculations in MATLAB, uh, but that does work for the most part. And uh, 
yeah, so the, the Python is kind of our, our most supported interface, I would say. So actually, Mo, the, uh, so in the chat, Mo asked about the multi-jack uh, solver for one-dimensional planes. That actually doesn't use sundials. Uh, we have a, a, uh, a built-in um, matrix solver there that relies directly on the underlying, or that relies directly on the linear, basic linear algebra BLOS libraries, or LAPAC. The sundials is used in the in the zero D reactor solvers, so in the reactor net, which we'll get to this afternoon in some of the sessions this afternoon. So uh, we have break now until eleven thirty. Well, eleven thirty Eastern time, um, ten uh, ten thirty Central. All right. All right, so uh, again, I'm gonna start with just a quick introduction to the next um, section, and then we're gonna uh, send you out back into your, into your breakout rooms to, uh, to work on this next bit of code and uh, interact with some of the volunteers here today. Um, okay, so let me share this again. There we go. Right. Okay, so we're going to do the same problem. Um, and this uh, intro at the top of this notebook is all exactly the same as what we showed before. But this time we're going to use Cantera to do it. And um, uh, Cantera, what we're going to see here is that Cantera makes this problem a lot easier to do and, and, uh, and should result in quite a bit less typing um, to, to get an answer for us. So uh, what I want to start by saying is that the general solution procedure in Cantera is the same, um, no matter what kind of approach you're taking. Um, there's three basic steps here. We're going to identify or create an input file. The new input file format, starting with Cantera 2.5, which we released a few months ago, is uh, based on the YAML format, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, uh, after you have your input file, you're gonna load that input file into Cantera to create the phases that you need and set your initial or your boundary conditions, depending on what kind of simulation you're solving. And then you're gonna actually run your calculation. Um, and so as you'll see uh, here in this example and the next one we do um, with the full equilibrium, uh, these steps are the same. When we get to the afternoon and go through some of the examples this afternoon, you'll see a lot of this, the same thing. It's these three steps. It's, it's find an input file or create an input file um, in your code, whether that's Python or MATLAB or C++ or whatever, create your phases, set the conditions, temperature, pressure, mole fractions, mass fractions, uh, surface coverages, whatever you need to set to, to create the boundary conditions or the initial conditions for your problem. And then, uh, if you're using Cantera's uh, built-in solvers to um, uh, create those and then run the simulation, or if you're uh, writing your own uh, solver to write out those ODEs and, and plug it into the solver and, and let it go, okay? So we're gonna start here. Um, the complication, I guess, that we're adding in this example is now we're adding a Cantera input file and we're gonna do um, a little bit of uh, writing out of that input file explicitly which is not something that you'll typically be doing, uh, at least not in, in most of the cases that I'm familiar with. Um, uh, but in this case, just to get everybody familiar with the format, and so we all have an example, uh, we'd, we'd like to kind of show a little bit more about the, the input file format here. Okay, so I'm gonna talk very briefly about the um, YAML format, and then we'll go back out into our breakout groups and uh, uh, fill in all the code and, and solve the problem and solve the problem here. Um, okay, so in the end, what we're gonna do here is uh, an equilibrium calculation. We're gonna use Cantera to 
uh, solve, the, solve for the equilibrium of a mixture of our uh, five uh, components, methane, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, water, and carbon dioxide. In Cantera, um, and actually more generally, for an equilibrium calculation, you only need thermodynamic data. You don't need any chemical kinetics. Uh, you don't need any transport data because by definition at equilibrium, there's no further reactions happening. There's no further transport happening. Uh, and so those, those coefficients are irrelevant. Um, if you are interested in the process to get to equilibrium, then you would need that stuff. Uh, we support, or Cantera supports a number of different possible formats for thermodynamic data from the really common uh, NASA 7 coefficient polynomial, usually in two temperature ranges, um, which is the format that's used for Kimkin. Uh, the uh, NASA 9 format, which is a little more recent format that's used by um, Thermobuild and uh, CEA. Now, um, we can do, or Cantera can do um, constant specific heat assumptions, uh, um, uh, a fixed Gibbs enthalpy or Gibbs, uh, fixed Gibbs function. Um, there's a, a, a bunch of different ways that you can format that and or that you can input that data and it's all available on the Cantera website here. Um, Cantera also supports real gas equations of state. Uh, in particular, the Redlich Huang equation of state is supported right now. And there's some ongoing work um, uh, with uh, Stephen DeCalloway's group um, to uh, add the Peng Robinson equation of state as well. Uh, so you can use those equations of state for the equilibrium calculations or for the um, zero dimensional reactors. Unfortunately, we can't use those for 1D flames right now because it's, it's uh, it requires uh, going back to the flame equations and rederiving everything without the assumption of an ideal gas. Um, okay, so here we're going to create our Cantera input file by hand. But like I said, that's usually not necessary. Um, you can convert them from the Chemkin format, which we'll see in the next example that we do. Um, and you can also have uh, uh, Cantera input files that reference other Cantera input files. Um, it's just Cantera input files all the way down. Uh, and so, as I mentioned, Cantera 2.5 introduced a new format for input files, uh, which we call the YAML format. In older versions of Chemkin, uh, in, in Chemkin, oh my goodness, in Cantera, uh, we supported uh, two, two different formats. One was called CTI, which stood for Cantera input file. Uh, and the other was a, a CTML, which was an XML-based format. And um, those are still supported in Cantera 2.5, although they will be removed in Cantera 3.0 when that comes out in the next couple of years, uh, hopefully in the next couple of years. So the reason we wanted to move to the YAML format is because it's a standard data interchange format um, that uh, there are libraries that read YAML files in every programming language um, that I'm aware of, at least. And, uh, uh, and that means that um, you can read these input files. Uh, they don't have to be just Cantera input files. You can store extra data in them if you have um, extra data about your uh, simulation conditions or about if the, the input file was generated by another program. You can put all that data in this file. So uh, that's really nice. And um, the other nice thing is that it's pretty easy to read and write as a human. Um, of course, XML is also available in every uh, programming language under the sun, but XML is. If you ever tried to write out XML by hand, it's not pretty. So we switch over to YAML. YAML stands for YAML Ink Markup Language. Um, so it's like a recursive acronym. And it's a declarative data format, uh, which, has, which has two main um, structures. There's a mapping, which associates a key with a value, and an array, which can collect multiple data into a single value. And so these two structures are pretty similar to a Python dictionary and um, a Python list, if you're familiar with uh, uh, dictionaries and lists in Pythons, okay? We actually have a, a nice tutorial on the YAML syntax, the general YAML syntax in our documentation online, okay? And the, uh, uh, the main thing that you wanna see here is that the, um, in Cantera, the valid input files uh, must have a mapping with the key fate called phases, okay? And then the value of this mapping is an array of phase definitions. Okay. And, and that just tells Cantera where to find the thermodynamic reaction information, the transport information for all the species and reactions uh, in your system. So um, I think I'm going to, yeah, I think I'm gonna keep going here. 
Uh, and just, um, this is included in your notebooks that we distributed. Uh, I didn't clean this out because I figured this would be a lot of typing, a lot of typing for people to do. Um, so I'll, I'll explain this YAML format here very briefly, and then we'll go out into the breakout groups. Um, okay, so uh, in this problem, we're trying to do complete combustion. Uh, meaning that we only want the, the five species, CH4, O2, N2, carbon dioxide, and water. And what we're going to do is, using this Cantera input file format, we're going to pull that um, the data that we need from the GRI 3.0 mechanism. So the GRI 3.0 mechanism was developed in the, in the 1990s, in the early 2000s, um, and it's, uh, uh, a, uh, it's not uh, considered... Uh, I would say research grade anymore for most problems. Um, you should be using a more modern mechanism than one that's 20 plus years old. But the advantage is that it's distributed with Kintera. So for our examples, we use it pretty frequently and we're gonna use it here. And what we're gonna do is write our own input file that pulls the data that we need from the GRI file that's included with Kintera. Okay, um, you can pull data from any input file that you have, whether it's included with Kintera or it's another one that you've generated. So it's, it's really easy to generate like sub mechanisms in this way. If you only want the data for a particular set of species, if you only want to work with that particular subset of species. Okay. Um, and so doing this, using this, we're going to restrict it to exactly the five that we had in the last notebook. So we can more directly compare the results. And then in the ne next notebook, we'll load the full GRI 3.0 mechanism and, and do the full equilibrium and see what we get, okay? So what we're gonna do here is um, a little bit of Python magic, uh, which is that um, we've created a string which contains the definition of the input file. And on the last line down here, this writes out the, uh, that string into this input file. Okay, so this is going to write a file onto the, the disk on your computer or, or onto the Jupyter Hub uh, in this folder called input file slash methane dot yaml. And what we have here is a, uh, at the top level, we have this required key called phases. Okay, this is the only key that's uh, actually required in every Cantera input file is a definition of phases. And um, uh, this is going to be the name of the key and then a colon. Right, so this is a mapping. And below that is a one element array. And the array starts with this dash. And inside the array is stored a mapping. So um, another way to write this might be uh, like this. Um, phases, and then an array. So I have name is methane, air, thermo is ideal gas, and so on. So I don't know if this I don't know if this syntax would make more sense to you. Uh, maybe if you're more familiar with uh, uh, with Python, this this syntax might look more familiar. But these two, except for the fact that I'm missing some of them here, these two uh, definitions are equivalent to each other. So I'm going to comment this out so I don't actually use it. Okay. So what we're telling Cantera is that this phase should have the name methane air. So when we load this file, the uh, we can refer to uh, uh, we can get this name out if we want to, to store it somewhere. We're telling Cantera that this is going to have um, ideal gas thermodynamic behavior. So we can use all the ideal gas functions for the thermo. And then um, to load species, in this case, we are loading species from the um, GRI 30 uh, file, which is indicated by this line here. You can also include species definitions directly in this file, uh, in this YAML file, if you want to which is typically what's done when you convert from a Kimkin format, which we'll see um, a little later on this afternoon or this morning rather. Well, it's approaching afternoon here. So um, what this line is saying is within the GRI30.yaml file in the species key, um, use these five species in this input file. Okay. Oops. Use these five species in the input file. All right. So what questions do you have about any of that? If you can throw them in the chat. Oh, 
well, let me actually run this. So I create the input files that, I, that I'm going to need for this example here. Okay. What questions do you have about that? All right, then I'm going to stop sharing my screen to so put everybody back into their breakout groups. Um, it's probably going to be a different breakout group. I think, oh, no, it's going to be the same. Yeah, it should be all the same. Okay, so, um, and we'll meet back here. Uh, so at 12.05, well, 12.05 Eastern, we have another break, just a, a little shorter break. Um, and then we'll come back into the main room here um, at 12.15. Okay, I think I've got the schedule right. All right, awesome. Here we go. All right, hello everybody. Welcome back from our second break there. Um, so we're going to uh, go through our last notebook for the morning session covering equilibrium. And, and this time we're gonna do um, an example with full equilibrium and we're gonna talk a little bit about input file conversion. So we're gonna start with a Kimkin format mechanism of uh, uh, one of the um, Galway mechanisms from uh, Professor Curran's group. Uh, so uh, um, so we'll see how that process works. And um, I understand that some folks had, uh, had some problems with the input files in the, in the last session. Um, so we'll try and get those sorted out here uh, as we go through as well. And we'll take a break at, at one Eastern. So in 25 minutes or so, I mean, 35 minutes for, uh, for lunch. And we can continue to talk about some of this stuff over lunch too. Um, okay. So let me share my screen again. All right. Okay, so again, we're doing this uh, uh, adiabatic flame temperature. All of this is the same. Um, and again, the problem comes down to where do we get our enthalpies from? So the first time we did this, we did it with uh, the GenF tables and just assigned some regular Python variables to, uh, to, to calculate that. Um, and assume constant CP. In the notebooks that we just finished, uh, ideally you were able to see a case where we created our own input file, um, loaded a few species from GRI30.yaml and got a, uh, uh, a um, uh, let's see, sorry, uh, a, a different or maybe a better estimate of the, uh, the adiabatic flame temperature. And so this time we're going to load a full um, a full combustion mechanism. Uh, we're going to load the full GRI 3.0 mechanism with all of the species we're going to load, as I mentioned, one of the mechanisms from Galway, um, and calculate the adiabatic flame temperatures, assuming full equilibrium of, of all the species, at least that are in the model. Um, okay, so, uh, and so this full equilibrium better represents a, a, a real combustion application. Um, and again, just to emphasize, when you're doing these calculations with Kintera, we're going to identify or create a YAML-based input file. You're going to create the, a phase that you need and set your initial or boundary conditions, depending on the simulation. And then you're going to um, set up and run the calculation using either Kintera solvers or your own solvers, okay? Um, one of the, the uh, uh, great things about Kintera is a lot of the code is transferable between different input files and different ways of operating. So in that last notebook, in that complete combustion notebook, we created our own input file that we called methane.yaml, which, which had only the uh, five um, species in it. And then we went through and ran uh, the equilibrate function to set it to set that, um, that solution to the equilibrium state. And all of that code is actually gonna be exactly the same uh, in this example. Um, because uh, all we need to do is change the input file and Kintera is able to handle all that in the, uh, in the background. So um, 
let's take a little more detailed look at the input files now. So uh, uh, Cantera comes with this, uh, a few predefined input files, oops, typo there. Um, with a few predefined input files, um, the GRI 3.0 mechanism, which we've been using, there's also a, a hydrogen oxygen sub mechanism, um, which I believe is extracted from the GRI 3.0, uh, if I recall correctly. Um, and there's a few others that represent that we used in some of our examples as well. Um, in, in most cases, we include these files mostly, as I said before, for demonstration and to use them in, in the examples uh, so that you can have something to run right away when you download Cantera. But they don't necessarily represent the uh, best understanding that we have right now of the uh, state of the art in, in terms of combustion modeling. So in this example, we're going to use one of the more modern mechanisms and we're going to choose the, the Galway mechanism uh, that was the that has been released, I think, in the last year or updated in the last year. Uh, and so we're going to convert that from the Kimkin format that um, Henry Curran's group released um, and published with their paper and published on their website. We're going to convert that from the Kimkin format into the Cantera format. Okay, and so you should see um, if you go over to your your tree view over here and open up the input files folder, you should see a folder called NUIG and uh, delete that because that's the file we're going to end up creating. So you should see here uh, three files which include the mechanism, the thermodynamic data, and the transport data. Now for our purposes, um, we only actually need the thermodynamic data, uh, but we're going to include the transport data and the reaction data just to show a case where you're um, um, converting the entire thing. So we can open this up here and it's a uh, um, Chemkin format. Uh, if you've opened one of these files before, this will be very familiar uh, with some couple hundred species and probably a few thousand reactions as well. Uh, so this will have this .mech file will have the uh, reactions and the species in them. The therm file will have the NASA uh, uh, 14 coefficient polynomial fits. And the transport data file will have the um, transport data for the, the species. Okay. And Cantera comes with a Python script that's called CK2YAML that lets you convert from uh, uh, the Kenkin format to the Cantera YAML format. Okay. So we're going to run that in the, in the Jupyter Notebook here. And so if you don't have the Jupyter Notebook open, please open it and run these. These cells should exist for you. You shouldn't have to type anything here. So just make sure that you run it. And then we're going to make sure that, that the appropriate file gets generated at the right times. Okay. So what we're doing here is um, defining a few variables to, for the input file, the mechanism file, the thermal file, the transport file, and the output file. Okay, so these first three are in the Kinkin format. And this last one, when it gets generated, will be in the, in the Cantera YAML format. Okay. So if we push um, shift and enter to run that cell, uh, it'll give us a bunch of output down here. Uh, and um, hopefully it works. Yes, you're supposed to get an error this first time. Sorry, I'm getting a message in the, in the background. Um, so you're getting a lot of output here, okay? The, this output um, is just a warning because the thermodynamic data source has uh, uh, extra species in it, okay, that are not defined in the mechanism file because this is the high temperature mechanism, uh, not the complete mechanism. Okay, so we keep scrolling down, 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 there we go. And at the end, we'll see actually there's an error. Um, and it's because if you, the way to read these errors in uh, Python is uh, uh, to start at the bottom of the error message and read up. Okay, uh, you don't want to start at the top, you want to start at the bottom and read up. And so the error message is actually all the way down here. I wish it was colored, but it's okay. Um, and it says that it's ignoring duplicate transport data for this species, which means that the transport file has um, um, data, two lines of data for the species PC3, PC3H4OH-1. Um, and it's really common to have error messages like this when you're converting data from the Kenkin format to 
uh, Kintera format. Um, whether you're converting to YAML or the older CTI um, format, uh, it's really common that the Kemkin format um, files, uh, that the parser that's used in Kemkin is a little bit less strict than the one in Kintera. Um, so uh, one of the ways that you can solve these errors is by adding an extra argument to the, um, to the converter. So this first time we used it, we specified four arguments, the input, which is the um, reaction file, okay. the thermo, which is the thermodynamic data, the transport, uh, which is the transport data. And then we asked Cantera to, to put, put it into an output file, a specific output file. We're going to add um, one more option now, which is called dash dash permissive, which takes some of these things that are, that are um, in the most severe case an error, and makes them into just warnings instead of errors. Right? So the reason this is an error initially is because if there are two lines with this data for um, this species, Cantera can't know which one is correct. Right? They could be identical or they could be different. And we have no way of determining which line the authors meant to be used. Now by default, Kemkin will choose the first of the two, I believe. And it usually prints an output message into its output. Uh, that that's what it's doing. But because it's not an error, a lot of people may not notice that. And so we we prefer to make it an error and and, and make force you to deal with this in some way <laughs> um, to, to make sure that your simulation is accurate. Okay. So this is just one possible error. There's a whole host of possible errors that can that can show up. Um, and so we collected a lot of these errors in this section called debugging common errors in Kempkin files which gets linked at the bottom of the error message here. And so you can look at this, uh, at this section in the, uh, on our website for a little bit more help debugging um, Kempkin files. Uh, okay, the conversion process anyways. So for this one, um, we're just gonna add the permissive option. So at the end, we're gonna add dash dash permissive. And again, if you're following along, please run this, please run this cell yourself as well. Okay, and that's going to take a little bit longer to run because it's actually going to succeed at the conversion this time. And um, it's going to try and validate the mechanism at the end by loading it into Cantera. All right, and so that, um, that's completed now. So now you can see that there's um, many lines that have uh, duplicate transport data for all these species. Um, and so uh, in this case, Cantera, by adding the, the dash dash permissive option, we instructed Cantera to, to just choose the first of those two uh lines and and put that into the output file okay, so then uh Kintera tells us it wrote this input file or that mechanism file it contains this many species and this many reactions and then it gets loaded by Kintera and gets validated to make sure that there's no errors in um, any of the reaction specifications or something like that that wouldn't get caught necessarily on the conversion process um for instance uh, uh negative um, logarithms of the, or logarithms of negative numbers and things like that. But in this case, it passed with just a few warnings that we'll talk about in a second. And so if you've run these two cells now, you should have, if you go back to the tree and look at all your files here, you should have now these three input files as well as this um, nuig11.yaml file. All right. And I see there's some messages in the chat. So I, I hope, um, that we're getting answers to those questions. And uh, the uh, CK2 YAML converter takes the, um, that Kemkin file and uh, puts it into our format. And uh, let's see. So here you can see a more complete phase definition uh, with the, um, the, the, the phases here. So this is going to be an array of phases. Again, it's only going to have one entry, um, which specifies the thermo model to use. Uh, in this case, it also includes the elements that are used in this uh, phase, a list of all of the species that are present. Okay. And if the species section contains a list of names like this, then by default, Kintera is going to look for a section called uh, a mapping called 
species with the with the key called species. Okay. And it's going to pull the data for these species from this section. So you can see that the thermo data for this uh, uh, species here was converted into the YAML format, including the uh, NASA 7 polynomial, as well as all the transport data here um, for that particular species from the transport file. We also told, or in the phase definition, uh, the default uh, for an ideal gas um, uh, uh, thermal phase is to have ideal gas kinetics. And um, uh, the transport by default will be mixture averaged. Uh, the other option is multi component. Um, okay, so, uh, oh, and then just to show at the end. So after all the species definitions, Cantero will also have written out the um, uh, reactions. And this section is started with the keyword, the, the key reactions, assuming I can find it here somewhere. Sorry for scrolling so fast. This mechanism has a lot of P-log reactions in it, apparently, which take up a lot of vertical space. Wow, okay, anyhow. So um, we will automatically, oh, here it is. It's the section started with reactions um, and it will read the reactions from that input file automatically uh, based on the, that, that definition there, decide what uh, 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 type of reaction it is. And if there's any um, notes associated with that reaction, it will uh, include those in this file as well. Uh, and these are ignored by the parser, by the chemistry parser. Okay. So, um, what questions do you have about that? Was everyone able to generate the YAML file in the end? Or are there more questions about that? There are a couple of errors that we're still trying to diagnose in the chat, but I don't know that we've solved them yet. Okay. Um, let's see. This is probably a case where you could jump over to the Jupyter Hub and those problems would at least go away temporarily in terms of being able to follow along today. Yes, in the in the breakout groups, yeah. I think there's a problem with trying to run the, the bang things in Jupyter. Um, so if you've got some other way to run CKT YAML from a, okay. a terminal, rather than trying to do this magic in a Jupyter notebook. You could yeah, so there's device. another way to do this, which is to actually um, import the module. Um, so let me add a cell here and I can show that. So you do from Cantera import uh, CK2 YAML. Get the chat out of the way here. I hope that works. And um, then you can run this as CK2 YAML um, convert Mac. Uh, input file is and therm. Uh, so I don't remember the uh, signature for this one. So I'm going to import it and then put a question mark after it. And that is going to um, uh, not work at all. Did this one? There it is. We made it look like Python. Okay. So uh, so by putting the question mark after this, we um, it pops up this window down here at the bottom, which shows me the um, definition of that function. And if there's any additional uh, information, it will print it out here. And so this is going to let me um, IP file, thermo file is th file, transport file is a tr file. Um, out name is op file, and then permissive is true. And if you do that, it should do the same thing uh, without calling out to the shell um, and and run it. So that I, I typed that all very fast because I've done that one or two times. Um, let me just space that out a little bit more easily so people can see that.
and All right. And if you want to check the duplicates, yeah, Phil, go back to the um, uh, original chem conversions. If you want to um, edit or remove or, or figure out which is the more accurate. This is also a very common problem with um, thermo, data, uh, thermo data files. Uh, people have kind of collected them over the years and they uh, add stuff to the top and chem can by default uses that, so. Uh, Okay. Oh, sorry, I didn't see that was a direct message. Um, oh, let me keep that on the screen, sorry. Okay, so I'm going to uh, stop sharing here so I can send everybody out into their breakout groups again, and we can finish up this uh, notebook. After this is lunch, and then we're going to come back um, in the uh, uh, gather town at uh, two o'clock and uh, we will start the afternoon sessions at 2 p.m eastern uh, so if i don't see you back in here in the main room or if i don't catch you in your in your breakout groups have a good lunch and i'll see everybody um, after that all right so oops i didn't close the rooms